Uh, another famous weekend in Club Hurling across the country. Uh, we're brought to you here in our game by OrgaRetro.com. If you want to get 15% off jerseys like this Tipperary one or that Mead one there that Michael Verney is wearing, go to OrgaRetro.com and put in the promo code our game. Now, we're kind of partly wearing the Tipperary colours for today's show, you know, in, in tribute to Killadang and getting through to the county final in Tipperary. Then you also had the likes of Port of Ferry wear, wear these colours. They got a win over the weekend. Rossa, their journey in Antrim came to an end. Loch Ray, albeit a sash rather than the hoop, they uh, they had a massive win in Galway. But uh, we'll start off with Tipperary because what a weekend it was, the last weekend for the quarterfinals. But a damn squib of a weekend, like, because Kiladangan completely saw off Drum and Inch, 121 to 9 points. Loch Moore dismissed Nina. And this was the thing we were worried about with Nina that after doing so well against Turles Sarsfields, that they'd flop, and they surely did here, losing by 10. But Kiladangan against Drum. What kind of, uh, yeah, well, it just seemed to me that Drum and Inch were able to take advantage of Burris Lee um, because they knew it was going to be long ball all day. So they were able to plan for that and they were able to work the ball up the field. And they got, I suppose, to some degree, they profited from Burris Lee gifting them opportunities for goals. And they, they seized it, they won on penalties. They were probably fairly tired coming into this game, having played extra time. Left Seamus Callan a little bit isolated. Stevie Nolan got injured during the week, so a lot of things conspired against them. But with Kiladangan, you couldn't necessarily prepare for a long ball and be able to set up for it because they just use the ball really well and they've an awful lot of attackers that could punish them. So I'd say Drum, they're fairly devastated to just score nine points, but it was tough for them having to play extra time a week beforehand. You'd wonder what they were at during the week in training that a Fed actually got injured as well. To be honest with you, you know they were going they were going seven days between uh, extra time penalty shootout to a semi final. I, I would have been hardly lifting the hurls nearly all week. It would have been ju- just maintenance work, but because they looked really really jaded the other day, uh, yesterday I should say. I was down there, uh, was hoping kind of it would take off. It never really looked like it was going to take off. Kenneth Angan had a really good spread of scores. I think the goods of about ten lads got in the score sheet for them. Drum hit two points from play over 60 minutes. Like two points from play over 60 minutes. Didn't score from play in the second half and never really looked like scoring. Did a couple of half goal chances and things like that. Uh, Kildangan just brought way more energy, uh, way more nouts to it as well. They weren't they weren't just, I, I'll put you this way. Drum played into the sweeper's hands. Kildangan, Robbie Long hardly got on a ball for Drum. They just played the ball around them. They, they, they were snapping balls 20, 30 yards. Willie Connors, uh, Joe Gallagher, they were shooting from out the field. I thought they were just really smart, really economical with the ball. And despite eight first half wides, they were totally in control at half time. Brilliant goal by Brian Malachny as well. Took the ball down lovely in the air, knocked it down, flicked it over a defender's head, then put it through on Collins' legs. They just they just had way more energy and were t- and tactically, to be honest with you, they were way more astute against a side who we're probably just on the come down maybe from a big win last weekend and everything that comes with it. A, a week is a very, very short time when, you know, the emotional uh, drama and emotional exhaustion of a penalty shootout win, particularly against your, your nearest rivals. I, I couldn't help but thinking, though, after yesterday evening, that Boris really must be kicking themselves because it would have been nip and tuck, I think, between Kiladangan and Boris. And uh, Boris would have, Boris have the forwards that could really, really hurt them and have a good spread of scores. Whereas Drum just didn't really show anything yesterday, and it just it's an unfortunate way to live out a championship having looked like contenders a week previous. Yeah, and Stephen Gleeson was saying on Tip FM that the Drum and Inch players had jumped into the river at the Sand Trap uh, after the Burris Lee game, so they obviously were looking for a recovery. And I, uh, and you do wonder how a lad gets injured, but it can happen any amount of ways. He could have been just doing, you know, I mean, you're you're obviously going to do something in training. You're going to do your warm up. You're trying to going to try and get the body limbered up again. Maybe do a few sprints, few drills, whatever. It can happen any sort of way. So we're not sure how that happened. The players. I have, just just tactically, I thought I thought it was I I was just surprised by by what Drum did. Well, they were too I thought, defensive. Like yeah. I mean, Seamus Callan was isolated on his own. David Collins won a couple of balls, uh, but again, massively isolated. He didn't have anyone coming off him when he won the ball. And then David Butler was brought in when it was one fifteen to to zero seven, and he'd made such a huge impact against Burris Lee because he's a big physical player or whatever but the game surely that was, was a half time introduction surely that was a half time introduction they were, down, they, were, yeah, they were down by 7 having got themselves back into the game 
they probably needed to go on to like 15 on 15. Kildangan hit the first four points in the second half and the game was over and then they bring him on. They took off Johnny Ryan, they went orthodox, but they, like their goose was well cooked at that stage. Yeah. I just thought they, they had it, whatever chance they had to win in the game at half time, if they'd really kind of went for it and then all of a sudden four or five minutes later the game was over. Yeah, I mean, Johnny Ryan, now you expect one of the big players for your team to, to have a big game. He was... Like when he was driving ball up the field, some very like stray balls, he hit one directly out over the sideline. You want him to step up, he was ultimately taken off. Uh, I think James Quigley, he has to be mentioned, he was very good at full back for Kiladangan. Now they had those spare numbers back there and David Sweeney was mopping up, Alan Flynn was mopping up. And then they had so many threats up in the forward line, like Billy Seymour, he caught a bit of fire in this game. Or Billy Seymour, as Ken Hogan likes to call him in commentary, and you mentioned Brian Malachny, he was very good. Joe Gallagher won some ball and like got a couple of scores. He was very impressive. Sean Hayes carrying the ball, won a few frees. And then, of course, having Willie Connors and Ty Gallagher's pace out in the middle of the field. Like Willie Connors, you could argue he has one of the best touches in Tipperary in, in the senior panel. He's a lovely, lovely hurler. And, you know, he's possibly like, I think Ken Hogan mentioned at one stage about him getting tackled and pulled and dragged. And that when he was a younger player, he might have lashed out. But his temperament on the field seems uh, seems to improve nicely. So I think Kildangan are in a great place now coming into the final. But at the same time, having not performed in the two finals recently, they, there's kind of a pressure to actually sh- uh, show up in the final. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm that. chatting to Brian Lawler after uh, obviously the Kildangan manager and obviously an of Kildangan as well. And it was just put to him. There was kind of a press briefing for the county final after the semi final, and a lot more lads came in as well, and we got chatting them a bit as well. But the pressure of not having won one. So this is their third final in four years. If they're if they're beaten again, obviously it becomes more pressure that they've been bridesmaid so many times in recent years. I suppose they didn't show up against Tardis in sixteen. They they just left a bundle of scores behind last year. And it, it is it is massively important for them to, to probably get over the line. But this it's they're the sort of team that could probably win, you know, two or three over the next five or six years if they do get over the line now. They have all the talent to get over the line. And I think crucially they're not relying on any one man. You know, like if John McGrath doesn't hurt well for a lot more, they, they'll find it harder probably to win than if Billy Seymour doesn't hurt well for Kiladangan. Dan O'Mara might step up, or Paul Flynn will step up, or Sean Hayes will step up, or Brian Malachny. So I think the fact that they're not relying on any one forward, like Drum were, were totally relying on, on Seamus Callan yesterday, and it was their own doing really because he had two lads around him every time he got the ball. But really, really polished display, and they'll just be hoping even Brian Aller was saying they're just hoping to deliver a performance if they don't win having delivered a performance there's nothing you can really say and that could that could well happen it could be a high scoring shootout against Lockmore and Lockmore could win by a couple of points but I, I, at least if they deliver a final performance I think they'll be happy and I think if they deliver a performance they'll be hard beaten if they deliver anything like they delivered yesterday yeah and a lot of the times when it comes to these big games you ask yourself can I depend on this team for a performance? So Kildangan have to prove that we can depend on them to deliver in a final. Lockmore, who won county finals in the past, I mean, it's, it's seven years ago, I think six or seven years ago at this point since they won that double. But you can generally perform on them or certainly some of their players to deliver big, like John McGrath, Noel McGrath. Whereas Nina, time and time again, they win a big match like they did against Thurless and, you know, they battered them in the quarter final. Then they go and lose this game by 10 points. But I do feel quite sorry for Nina in in certain respects because they had lost Hugh Maloney before the game cornerback goes off injured early in the game Barry Heffernan then goes off um, he had an ankle injury so you're you're talking about half your defense gone now that started really poorly I think there were seven or eight points to one behind uh, Jake Morris had missed a couple of frees Mikey Heffernan missed the 65 then there was a goal chance for uh, there was another goal chance that Jake Morris missed when, but they were gone 10 behind at that stage before half time it was a really flat performance. Do you think it's anything to do with, with the, the expectation that comes after beating Thurless the way they did? I think it was Hurler on the ditch had it on Twitter that the last four times they've knocked Thurless Sars out of the championship, they've been beaten in their next game. And uh, I don't know if it's an expectation. There's always going to be an expectation with Nina Aero just because of the quality that they have. But their inability to, to front up, you know, with like, if they've been beaten, as I said, like no more than Kildangan going into the final if they're beaten after a good performance in a high scoring game or a tight game you know fair enough 
But to not deliver at all and be that far behind early and really, really chasing the game, having been absolutely outstanding the week before, 3-7 to a point up at half-time against Turles, then all, all of a sudden they're 7 or 8 down really, really early against Lockmore. I'm just really disappointed. Um, like, yeah, that, that would be as bad as any of their recent county final defeats as well. Do you know? And it just, they just didn't deliver again. And they're falling into that bracket with the likes of, like, Kilroan probably haven't got as far as Nina uh, in recent years. And been as maybe you know consistently there at the last four, last two, but they're just falling into that bracket where all the talent that they have, they're just not delivering the goods with what they have. Like there's other clubs would would take your hand off for you know a couple of their players and would think they're going to be winning county titles every year in other counties and any, even in Tip if they had a couple of lads that they have available to them. Like you, like Mikey Heffern and Tommy Heffern and Jake Morris in the forward line alone, and then throw Paddy Murphy in on top of it, and you're just thinking, like, how are they only scoring one twelve? But uh, just seems to be a, a problem to front up after delivering a performance, and it's happened far too regularly now. And Lockmore were brilliant; they really attacked the strength of Nina, which you would have assumed would be Barry Heffern at centre back. Now we don't know did he develop that ankle injury during the game or did it happen beforehand? But either way. Lockmore looked for John McGrath early from, from centre forward. He ran up the centre, one or three, I think, early on. Uh, another player were, ran up the centre. Like, they ran straight up the guts of that Nina defence, and they had them on the back foot from early on. John Maher was, sent, uh, was um, solid from centre back. Lorcan Egan did a very good, tight, sticky job on Jake Morris, who I'd imagine he ultimately got frustrated, and he got a red card. And I watched it back, and I watched it a couple of times. So I think... John Maher just tried to impede him a little bit and maybe pulled him and he just kind of snigged back with the hurley. Now, Fergal Horgan was absolutely entitled to give him a red card, but kind of, we all know the, you know, the lie of the land. Well, it's like this, Shane. I was, I, was at, I was looking at the Ballyhale game yesterday and uh, there was an altercation at the sideline just before half time between TJ Reid and another fella. And he did he did sneak back. Now, it was very... He probably sneaked back in a clever kind of a way, but he still did sneak back and there was no... Um, I think his man got a yellow card when they resumed after half time. But the, it just shows you how different games are refereed. Even like... I, I wanted to talk about the, the Seamus O'Reen Cup semi-finals at the weekend. There was a massive hit at the end, Mull the Hone were up a point and uh, Newport were going through and there was a massive hit and uh, the ball was the, the ball was spilled and Mull the Hone went up the field and the game was over and I saw Ken McGrath commenting um, basically saying that it would have been a red card in Waterford. You know, such is the way that games are refereed in different counties. You know, he was very strong on Austin Gleeson getting a red card uh, two weeks in a row getting two red cards. It just shows you how different, different games are refereed. Uh, in different counties. Yeah, absolutely. Thomas McGrath got a goal for Lockmore early or midway through the first half or towards the latter end of the first half. It was very poor from Nina. And I mean, not having your full back and then obviously your your cornerback taken off as well, maybe that adds to it. But it was such a poor way to concede a goal. Thomas, Thomas McGrath did well to finish it. But it was pretty much game over from then on. What I liked about Lockmore is how calm they are on the ball. Like they're not just going to lash it upfield. They'll always try and find the man in, you know, they'll try and take on a man, draw a man, pop the ball off. And you do think at times, this is the value of the fact that you're a dual club and all these boys are taught composure with Gaelic football from day one. I think sometimes like certain hurling teams or certain clubs or whatever, you do just lash the ball a little bit aimlessly because that's what you learn. Whereas in Gaelic football, you know, the era of just letting the ball do the work has long since passed. So I think that that's the beauty for Lockmore and that's why... Coming into this game, I was thinking, you, you more know what you're going to get with them. Whereas Nina, I mean, they scored five points in the second half against Turles Saris. So there were signs there that if they don't get those early goals like they did with Jake Morris the last day, are, is it going to be sustainable over the hour here as well? Yeah, no, that's, it's a fair point. What you mentioned about the football is really interesting because, you know, in the last like, 10 years in particular, when you kick a ball away or give a hand pass away, it's the end of the world of football. It really, mm. really, really is. You've given possession away. God only knows when you get it back. Hurling is getting closer and closer to that. There's not the same sympathy, you know, for a, a bad ball going into the forward line or an aimless kind of a pass or anything like that because invariably you're getting really, really harshly punished now as well. Um, it's going to be a good... We'll talk about it later in the week, I'm sure, but it's going to be an interesting clash in the final because you have two teams who use possession unbelievably wisely. And if their sweeper's been played... They have. They definitely had the capabilities of playing around the sweeper, 
So, uh, yeah, going to be a really, really interesting final. Um, as I said, a bit of pressure on Kildangan. Lock more are going to be kicking football. I think they're kicking football this Saturday. Chance to be in. By the time the hurling comes around, they could have two county finals to look forward to. So, definitely very, very interesting times. Which means advantage Kildangan in a way because they get to you know, rest up in the meantime, whereas Lock more will be putting out more or less the same players in a different code and not practicing their hurling in the meantime. So that is definitely, I think, advantage Kildangan. That doesn't um, that doesn't mean I think that Kildangan are the favourites, but there's an advantage to be had. Seamus O'Reen final coming up um, soon as well, because Laura are through and so are Mulnahon. So you were saying Bonner against Owen Kelly. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Owen Kelly, obviously, like he's, I think he's 38 now, still going strong from Mulnahon, putting over freeze and a couple from play. Uh, did a good did a good win against a, a, a kind of an emerging Newport team on Saturday evening. Laura had a great win against uh, Killinall yesterday as well. Bubbles the wire only came on in the second half. Look, I think he was fairly heavily strapped on his two ankles and had a hamstring injury and had to come back off. But a uh, good win, good win for Laura. Laura kind of kind of gone off the radar completely last year. So back in the final against Mullahan should be an interesting game. Uh, probably the youth of Laura maybe. Uh, Without you know, minus will say Bonner against the more experience of you know uh, Paul Curran, Owen Kelly, and then they obviously have Sean Curran thrown in there as well, and uh, Mark Kyo as well. Not not Mark Kyo on the tip panel, but another Mark Kyo. It's going to be an inter- interesting final, and uh, just seeing a lot of people from Lura. Obviously, Lura would be close kind of neighbours with us. They never thought to be watching Lura on a TV screen or on a laptop in in Turles, but that's the way it is at the moment. But yeah, two really really interesting finals coming up over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and then it's. Like you made a point there about bubbles having to come on and off and strapped up ankles and the hamstring and all that. Seen Barry Heffernan come off injured as well. Not ideal for for Liam Sheedy because he wants as many players as possible coming through on skate. But I mean, it's it's probably going to be the case across the board for county managers sweating on these injuries that are going to happen because it's been fairly much breakneck speed in a lot of these hurling championships, particularly in um, like let's say where it's dual code. I mean, the likes of Lock Moore. Liam Sheedy would be praying that the McGraths get through that. Yeah, just interesting, you mentioned about, about lads that could be out. Um, it was interesting here, James O'Connor, the Ballyhale manager, and we'll sure we touch on Ballyhale in a minute, basically saying that Adrian Mullen is back on the side of the pitch doing, doing work with their physio. Uh, he doesn't expect them to feature for Ballyhale, but he kind of did expect them to feature for Kilkenny later in the year, which would be huge. a massive, massive boost to Kilkenny. Yeah, massive boost. Um, obviously he'd be coming back in I think the injury probably happened in February-ish I'd say and probably had it operated in early March before COVID but um, the fair, he seems like he's on the on the road to recovery and it's funny uh, we've kind of talked about we're going to chat about Ballyhale and Kilkenny now we talked about like the new manager Michael Fenley being gone and they're showing no signs whatsoever of slowing down they were, they were outstanding particularly in the first uh, the first quarter against Clary yesterday ended up 418 to, to 11 points presumably you got a look at that it was fairly they were sharp in the open quarter in particular oh yeah it was like a minute and 24 they had in the space of a minute and 24 they had three goals scored and you know Clara were just out the gate Joe Dooley was tweeting there this morning watching Bally Hale yesterday never seen a team with so many hurlers with all the skills of the game do the right thing nearly all the time and that kind of is hitting on it they are not just letting the ball do the work they're letting their brains do the work and they're moving the other team around rather than just moving the ball aimlessly they're always thinking how can we stretch it how can we stretch it and then get the ball to tj he's obviously a massive threat and the opposition is thinking well we need to make sure that if the ball goes in his direction not only is his man trying to stop him but you have someone trying to get close by but then also you have to try and worry about colin fenley in in similar fashion that you need to get numbers around him then that opens it up for some of their other star players and they have brilliant players across the bro- uh, across the board yeah see they're really really smart and it's really hard to actually teach lads about how to do this in game so Colin Fenley is going to generally have a lad parked in front of him and he did for a good bit of the game yesterday so what do you do to draw him out you start playing short ball through the middle or to the wings you draw that sweeper out because he's becoming ineffective then you see that the sweeper is starting to be drawn out and then you put it in direct and you make hay just like they did like Richie Reid put in two or three long balls and just totally took everybody out of the game and it was one on one between uh, between Colin Fenley and, and the full back and in fairness 
Like Fenley, there's there's days there where he's able to get four four. Then there's other days where he's just been absolutely maul, and it's a it's a hand pass or it's something for someone else. And he set up three goals within the space of about ten minutes yesterday. He's absolutely outstanding. Well, one with his foot, one with his hand, and he set up TJ for the two of them. It's almost like telepathic now. When Colin gets the ball, TJ has gone off the shoulder, and he did the kind of the tennis smash into the net. But um, yeah, they can kind of play. They can kind of play it any way you like. They're just. I know it's kind of rugby terminology, but their game management, their game intelligence is really, really good. Yeah, and they're gathering momentum at the right time. We saw them have labouring at the start of the championship and only getting a late goal to draw against Tullerone, but they're fairly moving now. And you kind of wonder, is it harsh to say what were Clara doing to, to concede three goals so soon at the start of the game? After one goes in, do you think, okay, batting down the hatches is small, but probably not. You don't, you don't change too much just because of one goal. Two go in, you're thinking, okay, maybe we need to get extra numbers back here for a couple of minutes and steady the ship. Three go in and it's just game over. Yeah, see, and what you were saying there, if, you don't, if you're not panicking after one goal, but then all of a sudden, like, they're going to make a change and they're ready to make a change and then there's another goal gone in and then there's another goal gone in and your championship is over. Yeah. And they've been the team, they've been the team that pushed uh, Ballyhale closest over the last couple of years and just just got it wrong from the start. The matchups just... Just weren't just weren't right. The fullback was probably a bit small for for Colin, and he was able to kind of manhandle him a bit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just it's interesting on the power rankings we did last week. I had someone given out on YouTube uh, why O'Loughlin's weren't number one, considering that their their intermediates are flying it as well, and that they won the league. And in fairness, when you look at Bally Hale the other day, I don't think I don't think he can kind of argue the one, two, three, four that I had are all in the in the semi final. So now it's. Now it's the chance really to, if someone's going to take out Ballyhale, it's Ballyhale and the village and all Lachlan's and Dixborough. And we'll, I'm sure we'll go into the, the other quarterfinals now. Yeah, so James Stevens beating Mullinavat 121-16. to So a, a goal from Niall, a Niall Brazil penalty had them 113 to 8 points up at the break. Keen Kenny, who looks a really good prospect for the future, he had 5 from play uh, in that first half. Luke Scanlon with a badly broken finger though, I mean that that's obviously not ideal for them. But to come through that, like Mullinavat aren't, aren't an easy team at all. And the, the John Walsh course again, he scored 1-2 from play, all was very, very lively. But uh, good to get through that for James Stevens because it's, it's always a tough test. Definitely, yeah. They seem like the likes of Niall Brazel, uh, Keane Kenny, Connor Brown, Matt Root is obviously still there, Ty Dwyer in a full forward. They kind of are developing a fairly well rounded team. Maybe no, you know, they don't have the maybe the Jackie Terrell or the Owen Arkham, the outstanding players that they had for the last fifteen or twenty years, but they seem to have a really, really well rounded team. Luke Scallon's gonna be a big loss for the Valley Hale game. He's a broken finger. Um it was a really, really wild pull from the from the clip I saw, a really wild pull at the start of the second half. And it kind of, it was a yellow card given when it it was a bad pull. And it kind of that's the that's the only time you get away with a wild pull now. It seems to be is for a throw in at the start of the match or at the, at the start of the second half. They've, it's been punished maybe a bit more than it had been. But it's kind of the only time you get away with a wild pull. He's going to be he's going to be out for that semi final now. But it looks like it's going to be a massive loss. Here's a question for you. Now I, I don't know if you played midfield much over the years, but I would have played a good bit and gone in for the clash. And there are plenty of times when just by doing the pull you get a clip on the finger or the hand or whatever and you're thinking oh that, that wouldn't have been far off it wouldn't have taken much for that to be a broken finger there do we need a clash ball as such or do we you know should it is it getting to the stage whereby that should nearly be taken out of the game that it's still a throw ball but pulling on the ball isn't an option what do you think well i tell you what um there's a funny one now so when you do pull if you take a step forward and are willing to take the slap in the leg you nearly always win a free which i think is absolute rubbish if you put your leg in there for a clash ball without putting too like you deserve to have your leg taken off because you're basically putting your you're putting your leg forward to take a slap to win a free which i think is uh which i think is mad like it's a clash ball it's not like like it is a clash ball you throw the ball in and you're supposed to clash so if if a lad takes a step forward and takes a belt on his leg like it's not the other fella's fault for pulling like you know what i mean so i think it's a bit bizarre maybe it's something that has to be looked at um if they're talking about like wild play it's kind of the only time you will see a wild pull in a match is at a clash ball so maybe it's a maybe it's a case of you know to try and flick the ball away or i don't know you're not let pull shoulder high or something i don't know i do like it it's hard bit like the clash of the ash like you might never hear it if, if you didn't have a throwing you might never hear it again the butcher verney huh let me take his leg off that's all I oh hear. no 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 but i'm just saying like you have to you have to have a fair bit of uh toughness in it to throw your leg out there yeah. but it's 
I should not be punished for pulling when it's a clash ball because he stepped out in front. Like that's not my fault. Yeah, you know you, what I mean? You want to pound the flesh? That's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> um, so we'll jump on to one of the other quarterfinals here. We'll, we'll come back to the relegation ones in a little bit. But Dixborough against Bennett's Bridge that finished three twenty seven to two fourteen. Now we'll watch the stream of this game. And Dixborough absolutely annihilated them, really. It wasn't a game at any point when I saw it. And it kind of, what came to mind as the game was going on was Big City Club with great depth in their panel. They were able to bring good lads like Oshin Goff, Martin Gaffney and a few more off the bench. Whereas Bennett's Bridge don't have that same depth. And I don't think it would be a mass, massively unfair to say that Bennett's Bridge had a couple of average enough players coming on or on the team. Whereas across the board for Dixborough, it's really solid, good players. Now, there was missed goal chances for, for Bennett's Bridge in the second half. That might have made more of a game of it. Um, Blanchfield had a couple. Hugh O'Neill actually played quite well. Bill Sheehan did a bit of scoring for Dixborough and Killian Buckley. Now, he was, he was very good in the game. But, um, yeah, a couple of interesting comments from the, goal, from the commentator on the stream. I'm not sure who it was. But he was talking about a ball that was delivered into Liam Blanchfield at one stage and it was straight to the full back more or less and he was like, a horrible ball. If he had a if he had a Ferrari he wouldn't have got to that ball. And then there was another one now uh, where where the commentator was saying it was a funeral of the second half. So that actually did kind of sum it up. Like we're talking about a sixteen point defeat, which is a serious beating in a quarter final. Massive scoring from Dixborough. Three twenty seven is, is some score. Killian Buckley's playing savage stuff, on but stuff unbelievably consistent. I think Aidan Nolan is, is, is doing uh doing a shameless candle on it. I think he's got a goal in every game they've played so far, every championship game. And that's a goal from half forward as well, which is fair going. Uh, Lee Moore got one two as well. He's only eighteen. He's uh, he was in the Kilkenny CBS. I think he's getting his leaving sort of results today actually. So uh Dixborough Dixborough are um Sorry, their league champions actually they, they beat all Auckland after penalties, so they're they're flying they're flying high again. It's so important to have a clean bill of health. They don't. There's no doubts over Killian Buckley this year. They have everybody nearly that, that they should have. Um, and you could probably say the same about Auckland's who are very good against Aaron Zone. Aaron Zone, are, you know, they're usually the sort of team that wins a kind of an arm wrestle of a match, which is you know usually low enough scoring or one thirteen, one fourteen, that type of thing. But they never really raised the gallop the other day, and they were beating double scores two fourteen to ten. Uh, Mark Mark Bergen and Hugh Lawler are particularly good for the Lachlans. Um Going to be interesting, interesting semi-finals there. You have Lachlans and Dixborough, as I said, and Ballyhale and the Village are a repeat of last year's final. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting. I, I, I still would probably you probably be favouring Dixborough and uh, and Ballyhale at the moment, just on on everything that we've seen so far. But Ballyhale are probably coming in off comfortable wins, whereas. You know the village have had maybe harder harder passage through, and maybe even all Auckland's were, were tighter games in general. But uh, yeah, really, you know, three city sides and Ballyhale basically left the last four. Intra two really really interesting games. Yeah, I, I, plenty of people that I talk to in Kilkenny are talk about the depths and numerical advantages that the city clubs have. The fact that they sh they've so such a big pick. Do you think that most people? in the county would be happier to see the rural club win even though Ballyhale don't have tiny numbers or anything like that and obviously they have the history and uh, and the lineage to bring through class players uh, time after time but do you think most people would be looking for the rural team to get through here rather than the big city clubs? Sure the village is a, is a village obviously as well <laughs> um, a village within a village within a city mm. um, it's fair going for three for three city teams to be you know as consistent is it as fair they going are. or is it like you'd expect that from from clubs with those numbers and uh, usually to be more to be more of a pull for rugby and soccer and things like that and obviously more distractions in the city i even seen it in borough in a town there's, there's more distractions than for a lot of the rural clubs but I think in any other sense, if you'd said that, would people want the rural or city teams to win? When Ballyhale have won back to back all earnings, um, with due credit to them, I'd say people have had their fill of them now at this stage and they'd like to see new champions, but they're going to be very, very hard to dethrone. So there was relegation semi finals at the weekend. Tullerone saw off Dainsford. Uh, Richie Hogan missed the game with a hamstring injury. And, uh, you know, having been in a situation where they could have got to the quarter final, they're now heading for a relegation final against uh, Greg Ballycallan. So obviously that's not ideal for, for Dane's Ford. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Now, Richie absolutely shot the lights out last week with seven or eight from play. But this week on week thing would just not, not suit his body. He, play, he obviously played extra time in that game as well. And they went down. So 
that ju- it's just not possible probably for him to uh, to play games like that week on week. So I think that that relegation final is in two weeks' time. So they'd be Dane's for to be hoping that he's back right. And uh, what can you say? What can you say about the roar? The roar has been absolutely annihilated by Ballyhale the week before. Uh, put up a, put up a good performance against Ballycallan, all albeit winning at winning after extra time. But they had uh, they had all their bios back, as I'm sure you'll explain. Yeah, so they they won this game after extra time, two twenty four to four thirteen. But as we had been saying in the build up, there's five players, you know, Kieran Joyce, Joe Ling, um, a few more players, you know, they're key men. We had kind of suggested were they playing possum the week before Richie Lahey were playing possum the week before against Ballyhale and just making sure that they had everybody right. And of course, they the roar gave us their answer, didn't they? Afterwards, when they won the game, and they sent an old tweet. Just uh, we had said they'd played possum, and they sent us an image of a possum saying, "No, that's a possum with a big smiley uh, face on it." So a good bit of crack from from the roar there, and obviously they're safe for the year. So uh, uh, good to get that engagement with a, with a club, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and obviously they didn't exactly um, they didn't exactly deny our claims. To no. be fair, um, couple interesting interesting results in the Kilkenny Intermediate Hurling Championship as well. So uh, Bally Ragged are in relegation trouble, having lost to Carrick Shock uh, and Downey's side. They've actually been really unlucky. They lost to Goran on penalties, and Carrick Shock would have been fancy to be in the knockout stages, but they were beaten by St Martin's uh, last week. So it's coming down uh, Bally Ragged against JJ Laney's Johnstown Fenians to avoid the drop. Yeah. So like, that'd, be a big, that'd be a big drop for either of those. Bally Ragged won all Ireland only a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, Fenians obviously massive, massive history within Kilkenny. An absolute heap of all stars in that club. I JJ think they have Laney a really, teams. really old age profile, though. I think that's probably part of it that they had a generation and, you know, JJ Laney lording it at club level. But I think probably. The numbers might be there, or the the youth probably hasn't come through the way they'd hoped. So we'll see how that game goes. The Limerick Championship over the weekend. So that was back after a three week break, and there was a couple of quarterfinals. Now uh, Patrick's well and Kilmalik they were already confirmed in the semi finals. So doing this off South Liberty's three twenty to two twelve, and the Pierce double scores win over Valley Brown twenty six points to thirteen. South Liberty's actually started quite well against Dune. They were one five to a point ahead after fourteen minutes, and like when Darrow O'Donovan went off injured, I think a quarter of the way through the game, probably a situation whereby already been without Richie English and Dean Coleman, South Liberty's maybe smelt blood, but I think ultimately Dune just took over, and a scoreline at three twenty isn't to be sniffed at. No, definitely not. Um, it's a fair score to put up without without you know two of your key men. Uh, whether Darrow Donovan is fit for fit for the semi final is absolutely massive for them. Really, realistically, they just it's one thing it's one thing losing a lad during a game because you've gotten something out of him and you've started steady. But when you know you're starting a big game without a fella like that, it just heaps pressure on a new fella is going to have to come in centre back. When you switch to centre back or make switches during a game, sometimes lads don't think about it. You know, you just you just get on with it. But when you're preparing the whole week without one of your best players. Um, it just brings up a different conundrum so they're playing Kilmallock. Um if they have Darrow Donovan back it'd be a very very tight game and hard enough to call while Patrick's well and the Pearshig coming in the other side just what we mentioned the Pearshig are coming in Valley Brown obviously were missing a couple of key defenders Mikey Kiley and Colin Coughlin were out but that was a fairly convincing win now they're coming in uh, against uh, Patrick's well side who haven't played in probably a month I'd say yeah. and the Pearshig have a good win under their belt uh, got the confidence back and uh, kind of going again after a disappointing defeat in the group stages to Kilmallock. So um, yeah, that that that's gonna be. They're two really really mouth watering semi finals in fairness. Hard enough to call either of them, but I I probably um I probably favour the Pierce even going into that game. Just the fact that they have a game winner the belt. But yeah, you could they, they could go either way. Mm, I actually like we'll we'll obviously preview it later in the week. But I'm actually I have a sneaky suspicion for Patrick's well and their Tipperary type colours. Um, just in Westmead over the weekend, Castle Pollard beat Raharney. Now I said Rahini by mistake in the preview, but they beat uh, Raharney. That's the, dub- that's the Dublin coming out, yeah. <laughs> they beat uh, so Castle Pollard won three eight to one fourteen, and uh, no wait, actually that's a draw. Sorry, I got that wrong. And Loch Lane Gales uh, beat Delvin two seventeen to nine points. Now Antrim over the weekend, that was massive drama. So Dunloy they beat um, O'Donovan Rossa one twenty two to two eighteen. 
um, the teams had drawn in the group stages and done like they did very well because they lost Paul Shields who's obviously a great player for Antrim and uh, if he's unavailable for the final which will be against Loch Gale Shamrocks that'll be a massive blow but the Rossa players they played the same team more or less midweek in Gaelic football and like it's been that case for about five weeks and it took its toll now um Captain Michael Armstrong, he, he's normally centre back, but he could only manage to stand in full forward and he was basically on one leg and probably should have had a penalty that he, that he wasn't awarded. Stephen Beatty, he had to come off due to, to injuries. Now, Dunloy, they play intermediate football, but their hurlers aren't playing that this year, so they would have come in an awful lot fresher. Keelan Malloy, he was on top in the first half and um, I think he was running through Rasa. But Aidan O'Brien, Aidan O'Brien was put onto him and did quite well. So the the late winner then was from Chrissy McMahon, who apparently is one for the future for Dunloy. So a huge win there. Like O'Donovan Ross, we've been talking a lot about them and the strides they've made this year. Yeah, yeah, no, they're after making massive strides. Just difficult like that when your when your the bodies are getting so much traffic within a short space of time. And Dunloy are the sort of side that'll take no prisoners. I saw Keelan Malloy player on this year for Antrim in the what was it the Q Cup final uh, against Offaly in Navan and he was brilliant I think he had five from play that the lovely left handed hurler um, yeah but just shows that O'Donovan Ross there like you can probably throw a blanket over three or four of them actually throw um, Cushion Dahl in there as well and when you look at the other semi final like that's that's some score Lockheed and Shamrocks 231 Nabon 518 after extra time the amount of people that would have killed have been at that game uh, the entertainment the, the entertainment of it yeah, and the fact that uh, Donald Nugent, he was playing in the full forward line for uh, St. John's and his arm was in bits. He had his arm strapped up and he scored a couple of goals and a point um, with one hand, like one-handed heroics on a hurling field to know that you're in bits and you can't actually play properly and go out there and make an impact. That's the stuff of Shawnee McMahon with Clare back when he won that, uh, that crucial ball for Clare, even though he was going around with a dislocated shoulder. That's a fact, yeah. Crucially, I suppose, he, he's right-handed and it, it was his right hand that was okay and he was still able to do, like, the tennis pull for one of the goals, the power off it. And that's such a, um, it's such a kind of a lost skill in the game now. Like, you, you nearly, when you see lads doing it, you nearly think, oh, Jesus, like, someone's going to get hurt. It's such a rarity now. But he was absolutely outstanding, yeah. Like, it's the stuff of, uh, it's the stuff of dreams, really, that kind of thing. Like, as I said, Shawnee Mack, like, Claire wouldn't have won the All-Ireland without Shawnee Mack standing in corner forward. Did all their subs use? He had a broken collarbone, and he basically won that line ball that ended up with Claire, with Claire getting the winning goal. Like, it's it's absolute stuff of dreams, in fairness. But uh, Lockheed, Lockheed, obviously, getting getting through there, uh, just Asher. Serious, serious, serious. Like, club champions, obviously, in, uh, in 2012. And... Uh, Liam Watson back in action. I think I, I saw a tweet from him during lockdown, basically saying that he was back. It was almost like the it was almost like the Michael Jordan um, statement that he made when he said "I'm back" or whatever. But um, cl- a class player, class player, who probably still offer Antrim something at county level. He was brilliant for Warwickshire, obviously a couple of years ago, but a class act at club level. Yeah, Lockheel, it's taken them a while to get back here. They've had a couple of years of ropeyish form. Eddie McCluskey and James McNaughton were the main threats. Uh, Liam Watson, like you said, Shan McGrath chipping in well. And uh, Lockheel played without their first choice fullback, uh, Neely McGarry, and also their second choice fullback, uh, Tony McCluskey. So they'll need them for the final. So both teams, like we've talked about injury issues here, Paul Shields on one side and the fullbacks for Lockheel on the other. So that could very much skew the final or, or sort of favour one team more than the other. So very exciting championship there at the moment. The Clare Championship, so there was one of the quarterfinals being played this weekend. Aeroge Ennis saw a fecal 118 to 113. And Aeroge had lost their quarterfinal ties for the past four years in succession. So you can imagine that this is a massive monkey off their back. It sets up a rematch with Six Mile Bridge. And it's their first semi final appearance since 2003, which is quite incredible for, for a big town club. Hard to believe, yeah. For for like we're we're talking about Kilkenny and they're talking about the three city clubs. I thought you were going to say you said the big city club earlier on. I thought you were going to say big city life. Um, you were like it was uh, like you, you look at three clubs in Kilkenny absolutely prospering, and then you look at it, uh, Aero Guinness. We're obviously kicking football as well uh, to a decent level, but you would have thought that they'd be like in the last four far more often than they have been. Uh, amazing when you get that monkey off your back as well they'll probably feel like there's nothing to lose to it to some extent now because 
uh, no more than like even Boris and E last year. When you get up, when you get on a run and you're somewhere you haven't been before, maybe you're just able to express yourself a little bit more. But yeah, like you go down through it and you look at David Reedy and Shane O'Donnell and even Liam Curry, Danny Russell, Kieran Russell. Like they have a good, they have a good spread. They're not a bad side. Um, lots of mobility and lots of pace. So they'll be. They're coming up against I think six mile bridge down in the semi final, aren't they? Um, which which will be interesting. You have Ballier and uh, O'Callaghan's Mills on the other side. So yeah, definitely an inter- interesting interesting uh, semi finals in Clare as well. Yeah, just a word on on Fiekel who. Like they were tight on numbers with Con Smith out for the season, and then you know just before the game, James Noonan he was forced to withdraw, and they're very tight on numbers, so that was obviously a huge blow for them. Danny Russell he scored one eleven, David Reedy three, Shane O'Donnell got a couple, uh, Shane McGrath the majority of the scoring for Fecal. In down, Breda beat Ballycran two seventeen to seventeen, Portaferry soft Bally Galgett two nineteen to seventeen points, and in the Dublin Championship wins for uh, for Mayo Kula one seventeen to thirteen over Lucan. And Bally Bowden, they beat Nafina one fifteen to twelve. Having been behind for an awful lot of the game, they turned it around. So, strangely enough, it's the first time ever that uh, Kula and Bally Bowden are in an, in a county final together. Yeah, it's a strange one um, because you're looking at the, probably you're thinking of the two powerhouses over the last probably the goods of the last decade. Obviously, Bally Bowden did a did a five in a row there as probably ten or twelve years ago now, or when it started. But uh, two games that sounded quite similar, to be honest, which I was following. Lucan against your good selves and Lucan were five points to one up I think near the first water break Kula gradually got back into it um, Sean Moran's goal kind of left a cushion and probably changed the game and he were able to push on the last quarter and similarly with Bally Bowden who were not ch- not chasing the game but they were a couple of points behind for a good bit of way until Paul Ryan netted a goal and a penalty and then they were able to pull, pull away near the end but uh, it's funny because Nafina we talked about it going one or two ways for them to beat Kula earlier on in the season um, pretty comprehensively in a high scoring game and you're wondering are they going to kick on or is the expectation going to get to them a bit so you had kind of the young guns against the real experienced kind of soldiers yesterday and Bally Bowden in fairness like Bally Bowden and Kula um, in fairness the Dublin County Board took uh, preventative measures when by moving the county finals and they must have fancied the two of them to get through because that's the way it's after working out so you have Kula in a senior B football final and a, a senior A hurling final, and you have Bally Bowden, which is I know it's a like they're a massive, massive club with crazy numbers, but to be in hurling and football finals in the same season is a fair effort. It's is they're quite telling that both Kula and Bally Bowden had really heavy defeats in the in the group stages. So Nafina fairly battered Kula, and it was only a couple of late goals that brought a bit of respectability on the score sheet from our point of view. Bally Bowden were hockeyed by Kilmacud Croaks. And now both Nafina and Crokes are gone. Had their big win probably when it wasn't at quite a telling a stage. Whereas Kula, Kula and Bally Bowden, they've built into their season. And both will feel relatively confident going into this final. Yeah, see, you can't you can't place too much stock on those early games as well. Like you just, oh, the main thing is that you're just still in the championship when it comes to the knockout stages, and that's when you're delivering your best. You were obviously um, you were you were at the game. You're probably eyes in the stand. Um, from the coolest side anything in particular obviously Con was playing um, I have a mate involved with, with Temple Oak Sing Street in the football and he was watching very very closely to see whether he played Hurland this weekend so he obviously knows that he's going to be playing football next weekend now in the in the football final or in the semi-final I should say um, what, what like Kula have obviously taken that defeat pretty well and bounced back and even Colin Cronin was very very good yeah. massive impact yeah Colin Cronin like he- Working as a doctor, he's um, he's had been doing huge hours throughout the summer, so he wasn't in the starting team. Came on, made a good impact in the second half, and you know, let's call a spade a spade. Lucan were the better team in the first half. Now, from a cooler point of view, you'd be a little bit disappointed with some of the shooting, but they stopped the ball getting into Khan. An awful lot of the players on the cooler team were very, very quiet, and it was just the game got tight during the second half. Cronin obviously made that impact. Khan started to get into the game a little bit and he set up a goal chance for Sean Moore, which he took. But to be honest, I think the goalkeeper is going to be very disappointed that it snuck past him. And at that stage, Lucan had been a point ahead with 12 minutes to go. And I think that just knocked the stuffing out of them. And, you know, they obviously had to push out a little bit more then. And, you know, Khan started to have a bit more of an influence. But it was one of those things where I'd say Lucan will come away very, very frustrated at how it went. And um, a special word to John Shane and did a very good job on Chris Crummy, who was centre forward, and obviously if you're if you're curbing the influence of someone 
who's that much of a leader for your team that's obviously going to go a long, long way to, to win the game like this. Yeah, John Shannon was on Tony Kelly, wasn't he, for parts of the All Ireland Club final yeah, as well. Yeah, Jake Malone was on, on him for a nice bit of it too, so I don't want to give John too much credit, but uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he, did, he did a good job there. And then Ballyboden and Nafina, I mean, it's one of those things been two or three points ahead of Ballyboden for, and you know, ticking away that way for a lot of the game, but uh, you have to be able to bury, uh, you know, a team like that that has had so much success over the years, and you talked about the those five titles that they've won and they've even added another couple since then you need to to bury a team you know i mean being two or three points you're you're never fully ahead of them and paul ryan is going to punish you from from set pieces all day as well whether it's free place balls freeze or 65s penalties whatever it is and uh, it's probably no surprise that they're back at this stage again because it's, it's only a couple of years since they were county champions and they're used to being at this stage so should be a good final anyway the galway championship big games on this weekend and the performance of the round would probably have to go to Loch Ray, who beat Liam Mellows, who've obviously won a couple of titles in in recent years. So it's a big statement from Loch Ray. Massive statement, yeah. Um, I would have fancied Mellows. Mellows obviously beaten in the last two finals, and uh, they probably had a long enough passage to get through to this stage. And just, I was chatting to Patrick early there, journalist in Galway, and he was just saying, you know, some people were wondering whether the three weeks in a row was was difficult on Mellows, but he did he didn't feel like just felt like that Lock Ray really came of age. They were missing Jamie Ryan, who was probably their talisman up front, and uh, he said they played well against Capitagal in the group stages where they beat them by four, but this was on a totally other level. He was kind of comparing them to the to the, the really good Lock Lock Ray teams that won a, a couple of county titles. And uh, he just said they have that kind of hardiness and toughness, but probably even more skill. A load of young fellas. Um, so Mark McMahon has got four or five from player from centre forward. They still have a bit of ex- experience. Emma Mahoney, obviously Johnny Cohn, who we know at Galway, Paul Hoban, who would have been on Galway panels, and Neil Keary. And um, he just said Ty Karen kind of got a goal for Mellows in the first half. It kept them in it. But the longer it went on, he just said the better, the better Loch Ray got. And it's a fair statement. Because Loch Ray had been beating a score or two, or Mellows have been beating a score or two in the last two county finals and obviously won the one the year before that. So it's a big, big result for them. Now they're going to have to probably raise it another level if they want to get through to a final, but a massive, massive statement. Uh, in the other game then, you, know, you, you were, uh, got a good bit of info on Turlock Moore and Sarsfields. I think Sarsfields were, Sarsfields hadn't conceded a goal in the whole of the championship and then conceded two goals in the first five minutes. But they were actually the better team in the first half. Joseph Cooney, Kevin Cooney uh, were very, very good. And uh, I think it was Ian Fox got one three from corner forward. But he, uh, Patrick Early actually said that of all the teams that where the fatigue did play him with the three weeks in a row, he said there was a clear drop off with Sarsfields in the second half. There was yeah. a, he said there was just a big drop off in their standards and Turlock were able to raise it another level with Sean Lalanne and Sean Loftus and even he said Dolly Burke came into it an awful lot and Kevin Hussey at wing back so uh, a good uh, a good statement from Turlock as well because it's, it's the first time where they've been faced with the pressure of you know playing a team that's won a county title in relatively recent years a team that's used to be in the last four and they had a bit of resistance and a bit of turbulence throughout the game and were able to come through it yeah and like Sarsu has got a goal late on and it's, I think it was a fortunate enough goal, so fortunate enough goal, and that kind of allowed them to rally late on. They lost by six, but you know, if you're getting a late goal like that, poxy enough, it kind of suggests that the game had gotten away from you. Joe Cooney was pushed from centre back up to up to the forward line, as you know, obviously you're getting desperate for scores. But Turlock Moore, I mean, Jamie Holland, very good at the back, uh, dominated at number six. Daniel Loftus, very good, got two from wing back. I think Kevin Hussey, who you mentioned, Sean Loftus, 1 4. We've seen him for Galway. He looks a very promising player. Sean Lanann with seven from play. Now, Dahi Burke apparently was very, very quiet at midfield, but he did score a couple of points at the start of the second half. But uh, yeah, very quiet otherwise. Uh, Kevin Cooney scored that penalty for Sarsfields, but uh, it's, it seems like it was pretty comprehensive overall. And I'd like to see Turlock more. I'd. I'd, I'd I'd hope that their next game is on, assuming they have a big match coming up next or a tasty clash, I'd, I'd like to see them on TV just to see, you know, just to see what the hype is all about. Yeah, we've heard a good bit about them. I probably haven't seen enough of them. Uh, we played them in a challenge game maybe, oh, jeez, it could be, it was when Michael Dunne was over them probably five or six years ago. Um, and I always thought they were, you know, uh, 
a dainty enough kind of side, but I haven't seen much of them in recent years. Uh, Patrick already t- took umbrage with you as well over your what he viewed as your slating of Galway Ireland. He said if you'd seen the two, the quality of the two matches yesterday, you uh, you definitely wouldn't be given out about the standard of Galway Ireland, which I thought was interesting. Well, so I'm happy to say the, the match I saw, there. like uh, the the matches I had seen the week before, were cat. There was no point in saying any otherwise. I watched him, and I was I was tearing my hair out watching Castlegar against. Um, uh, Sarsfields. It like it. it was you haven't have that much. You haven't that much hair to be tearing out now at this stage either. Jeez, that's the first time I've had my hair slated. Jeez, is, is, <laughs> is that where it's gone now? With the big spot eating head yet? Anyway, it's we'll, gone. Gone low. It's gone low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Saint Thomas beat Kilimer Daly, and that was expected to be a handy enough one. But one twenty three to two sixteen suggests it's an awful lot more comfortable, or sorry, less comfortable. Like only four points in it. Yeah, I think that it was the scoreline. It might be a bit flattering to kill mm-hmm. Daly. I think they were one. Thomas were one twenty one to fourteen points up with a couple of minutes to go, and Kilimer Daly got two late goals. But by all accounts, I think Thomas's were pretty slick. Anna Burke, who's lethal, lethal forward at club level, got six from play. Connor Cooney had uh, eight point six frees, two from play. David Burke chipped in with three, and Oshie Fannery hit one one. We were actually chatting about Dahi Burke last week, or not Dahi Burke, Fintan Burke last week, and it's interesting. Uh, I think they had a good bit of problems uh, at full back in their open round the game against Castle Gar and conceded a big score. So Fintan Burke has gone into number three, and by all accounts, he's been the answer at full back. Um, he's been dominating games. You have him at three, and Shane Cooney, who's hurting out of his skin at centre back. Uh, it definitely looks like Thomas's are making a, a fair charge for three in a row, and they seem like hell bent on. on uh, yeah, making a three in a row, especially after they've had a good bit of disappointment in recent years. Green Ballier beating them in an All Ireland club semi final, and Ursula Lee obviously beating them last year, and then the disappointment of the club final against Bally Hale in between. So uh, it looks like they're hell bent on three in a row. Yeah, and then Cap Tagles off Ahaskra Fahina, and Ahaskra had had a couple of late shows to get through, you know, to get up to senior A and then also to get through to this stage, but their luck kind of ran out. Yeah, I think they were actually uh, 11-8 up at half time and hit the first point of the second half to go 12-8 up and then Cappy got 10 in a row and the game was basically dead in the water. I think Parik Mannion picked up a knock uh, near the end of the first half and was kind of struggling for the second half. Wasn't able to, you know how dynamic he is and how he can be everywhere on the pitch. He wasn't able to do that. And I think Carl Mannion's influence kind of waned as well uh, they still had a bit of a late, late show they had like we're so used to them having goal chances at the end they had some of those chances again I think Noel Ward batted a free and I think it went just wide and James Kettle made a good save from Sean Blaheen but by all accounts the better team won out but uh, Cappy will have to improve for the semi-final I think it's, it's a Capitagal and Thomas's mm. in one semi-final and Turlock Moore and Lock Ray in the other as far as I know mm, so interesting Interesting semi finals. And then also in Galway, Canberra beat Kilnadima Leach from 116 to 114. Kerry, uh, John John Myler's Kill Moyley, they beat Abby Dorney 120 to 119. And Causeway, they're on route, or on course anyway, for back to back Kerry titles, beating Ballyduff 119 to 11 points. In Kildare, Confi beat Clane 217 to 17 points. Nace off, Leak Slip Handley and off 221 to 10 points. Then in Meath, uh, Trim, they beat Longwood 24 points to, to 3.12. And you were saying James Toher was the star man for for Trim. A couple of other results. Nafina beat Dunboyne. Kiltail beat Killian. Uh, Clanna Gale, they beat Blackhall Gales. And Retort beat Kildalki. And then finally in the Offaly Championship, Burr, seeing off Sir Kieran 128 to 116. And Everton was riding on this game. So that's a, that's a huge result for your men. Yeah, no, it is a big game. Uh, Sir Kieran had a few injuries coming into it. Joe Morgan played, but I hadn't done any training. And Anna Murphy would have played with Offaly, came on a, came on a half time. But uh, it was a good, good performance from us in fairness. Probably the biggest score we've put up against against good opposition in Championship Hurling in a long, long time. They said there was a lot on the line. Um, Morgan Watkins inside was very, very good in attack. Him and Nile Lines, only two young fellas, own cattle chipped in as he, as he normally does. Uh, it all kind of comes down to the Kuleri game this Saturday evening in Banner now. It's a, glo- it's a group game, but it's a glorified quarter final, so the winner is true to the semi final. Uh, we picked up a couple of injuries, we picked up three injuries actually this weekend, so the turnaround is quite short going into a game against an experienced side like that. So, uh, yeah, everything will be on the line that game. Going to be. Uh, going to be a tough one now yeah but so much to play for a last four plays we played 
what did we play? We played nine games to get to a county final last year, whereas this year you play four to be in a final. So, you know, it's a different different type of a championship. But yeah, that, that's going to be a tough game next weekend. Hmm, absolutely. So I think that's it. Have we it all said? All said, bye. We've it all said. Okay, brought to you by orgaretro.com. If you want to get these jerseys or any of the other jerseys that they have, go to orgaretro.com. You get 15% off with the promo code ARGAME. Thanks very much, Michael. Good, Shane. Good, man.